Don't you just love it when you're looking for new anime to watch, but every hidden gem, underrated anime recommendation list is just a rotation of the same, like, 20 shows you've seen recommended a million times before? Obviously, what counts as underrated or obscure depends on the person. It's all relative, we all have different levels of exposure to and knowledge of the medium, but it seems to me that most anime fans, in the English-speaking world at least, are seriously uncurious. Of course, this goes for any medium, but you would think that one with a fandom as massive and dedicated as anime would have more of a drive to go out and search for these hidden gems, if even out of a sense of contrarianism, surely. These works that virtually nobody, in the West at least, talks about, even though they're just as good or even better than the established canon of great anime. So this will be the first in a series of videos where I will be recommending some lesser known anime that I think are important or worth checking out for whatever reason, such that we might open up our horizons a bit, and perhaps in the end even reconsider our understanding of anime history and what we consider to be the so-called classics. A few years ago, I had the terrible idea of making a video about Evangelion clones. Mecha anime that came out in the years following the phenomenon that was Neon Genesis Evangelion, and which, due to its massive influence, displayed certain commonalities thematically, stylistically, and while I was looking for shows to talk about, I stumbled across an OVA that actually came out a few years before Evangelion, but that offered a similarly dark and psychological take on the genre. One that really stuck with me and made me wonder why this OVA wasn't more well known, and that was Hades Project Zero Rhymer. Directed by Toshiki Hirano and scripted by Sho Aikawa, who went on to write Martian Successor Nadeshko and Eureka 7 AO, which I haven't seen myself, but I believe everyone is really, really fond of. Zio Rima is adapted from a manga by former hentai artist Yoshiki Takaya, who would later create the Gaiva series. And Zio Rima actually was originally a hentai manga, but don't get your hopes up, the OVA is not. It tells the story of Masato Akitsu, a teenager who is captured by government agents and forced to pilot the titular Zio Rima in order to stop the evil organization Hao Dragon, led by the Empress Yurite, who is bent on world domination. One of the things that really stuck out to me my first time watching this OVA was the attention given to the villains. In each episode, Masato faces off against one of the Empress's underlings, the Hakeshu. But instead of feeling like just another villain of the week, we really get to know each of these pilots and gain insight into the various psychological turmoils they're dealing with, which feels very refreshing. Everyone here is a tragic character that you can feel some amount of empathy for. There's real depth to these characters, and while the Hakeshu pilots certainly aren't good people, their devotion to the Empress or flaming desire to fight and demonstrate their worth is contrasted with the cold, amoral operations of the government, who in the first episode we see kidnapping the main character, paying off the man and woman he believed to be his real parents, and then locking him in a cell until it's time to psychologically traumatize him even more by having him pilot a giant robot, at which point he develops a sort of split personality that takes pleasure in killing the enemy. Because of this, watching through the series, the viewer comes to see the quote-unquote bad guys as decidedly much more human than our protagonist's side. <laughs> It's not hard to see in this narrative an underlying political allegory about Japanese nationalism in conflict with a technocratic government, but the reason why this series reminded me of Evangelion specifically is in how it handles its themes in the context of the mecha genre. The questioning of one's identity, the intersection of biology and technology, the focus on the complex emotional and psychological reactions of the characters to these situations, and the ending, which I won't spoil, but suffice to say, it's not exactly a happy one. 
Overall, Hades Project Zeorima is a very interesting little OVA, with a deliciously dark and oppressive atmosphere courtesy of Yoichi Nango's art direction, and it's only four episodes, so yeah, go watch it. Shigeyuki Hayashi, aka Rintaro, has been around forever. He got his start in the animation industry at the tender age of 17, doing in-betweens on Hakujaden in 1958, and he would then go on to direct a number of episodes of Tezuka's monumental Astro Boy. And over the years, he's worked on a variety of different kinds of projects, different genres, different formats, but he's probably best known for his experimental, expressionistic visual style. And we find that here in one of his lesser known works, a little short film called Kaze no Matasaburo. Matasaburo tells the story of a young boy who becomes convinced that the new transfer student at his small rural school is actually a wind god from an old legend, the titular Matasaburo. Many of Rintaro's works feel like experiments in abstraction, and this might be one of his most minimalistic projects, which isn't to say that the film is without visual flair or moments of outright surrealism, but here Rintaro is more interested in the simple pleasures of a beautiful landscape. Yoshinori Kanemori's lineless character designs and animation style that's almost reminiscent of paper cutout animation give the film that storybook feel, and combined with those wistful, impressionistic, almost sketch-like backgrounds, imbue the film with a nostalgic aura, like a fading childhood memory. There's a gentle sort of magical realism to this little film that really demonstrates Rintaro's directorial range, contrasting with some of his darker and more epic works. If we're talking about the most underappreciated anime and anime artists, the name Takashi Nakamura has got to be pretty high up on the list. His most high profile job was probably serving as animation director on Akira, as well as providing the character designs, but he's worked on a ton of lesser known projects in the following decades, providing key animation for a bunch of different stuff, like for example two great Rintaro movies, Kamui no Ken and Genma Taisen. He also directed one of the short films in that Robot Carnival and Anthology, as well as two of the most truly unique and endlessly creative anime films of the past couple decades, A Tree of Palm and Catnapped, which I also highly recommend. But today I want to talk about something else he wrote and directed, and that is Fantastic Children, a 26 episode series from 2004. I won't really attempt to summarise the plot of this series beyond just showing you this opening scene, because it is a fairly convoluted story with a lot of moving parts, and part of the pleasure of this show is just jumping into it not really knowing what it's about, or what direction it's going to take, and constantly being surprised with every new reveal. <laughs> よみがえり生き続けることだ。何が目的だ。やつらベフォールの子供は意図的にたびたびこの地上に現れ、人類と干渉する。やつらは死んだふりをしているだけだ。数十年ごとに墓の中から起き上がり、この居る家庭に潜
In fact, one of the things I appreciate most about the series is, like I said, how it just kind of throws you into this eclectic world without holding your hand, without really explaining anything, confident that you will stick around despite the many questions and mysteries, because of how deliberately composed and paced out the plot is. You can sense that this is a project its authors put a lot of thought into, and so even if there are so many questions raised so early on, you never really doubt that they'll manage to make all these disparate elements cohere in a satisfying way in the end. And while the ending does resonate emotionally, whether or not all of it really makes sense, well, I'll leave that up to you. It's a fairly divisive show in that regard, I would say. The Flying Phantom Ship is a 1969 movie adaptation of one of Shotaro Ishinomori's early manga, directed by Hiroshi Ikeda, who, as far as I can tell, mostly just worked on a few magical girl shows like Sally the Witch and Akko-chan, before promptly disappearing from the anime industry. He also did the Animal Treasure Island movie, which was very influential to later animators, notably a certain Hideaki Anno, who lists it as one of his all-time favourites, so you should definitely watch that one too. But another early influence on Anno was, indeed, you guessed it, Flying Phantom Ship which features a giant robot designed and animated by the one and only Hayao Miyazaki, and it is a pretty cool robot. But if you're wondering what this movie is about and why it features both a flying phantom ship and a giant robot, well, I'm not going to explain that to you. The movie's only an hour long, just go watch it. The plot's full of twists and turns and various disparate genre elements, so much so that taking a cursory glance at the English-speaking reception of this film, among modern anime fans at least, there seems to be a general consensus that this movie is very strange, sort of muddled and confusing. One My Anime List reviewer calls it half-baked, writing that it begins weak with a flimsy plot that seems a little worrying in how plain it is, strongly resembling Scooby-Doo with the haunted house and dog. It rapidly changes later with an intriguing, underdeveloped plot and several big twists, almost reminiscent of Studio Ghibli's films decades later with how much it surprises the viewer, but not anywhere near as earned. Another confused reviewer remarks that this is a strange Toei film. Dealing with loss of family and addiction to soda seems to be the points of this film. And he's not completely wrong, either. I think one of the main causes for confusion with this film is that it's basically structured like an old adventure serial, with our protagonist constantly running into new, perilous and suspenseful situations. First a haunted house, then a giant robot attack on the city, later an underwater minefield, and an encounter with a monstrous octopus. We're constantly moving through these different chapters of the adventure, different set pieces, and so I can understand why this narrative structure structure and eclecticism may be a bit confusing for people who don't regularly watch old serials in poor quality on YouTube, and some of the latter parts of the story certainly do feel a bit rushed, but overall this is a very impressive work of animation that harkens back to a particular kind of pulpy genre fiction we don't really see too much of anymore. And it's actually all about propaganda, false flag operations, and the inner workings of the deep state. So, yeah, go check it out. Sometimes you come to anime for a fun, action-packed shonen series. Sometimes you come for a mature, psychological drama. Sometimes you just want to kick back and enjoy a relaxing slice of life series. And sometimes, just sometimes, you come to anime to see naked men with glass urinal bottles on their dicks. And that's okay. Do you like the works of Studio Shaft? Do you like Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei? Then why haven't you watched Kateni Kaizo, a Shaft OVA adapted from an early manga by the same author? This isn't really the kind of show that I can summarise, and I swear I don't just keep saying that because I can't be bothered to write a generic synopsis, although to be fair that is also true. It's mainly because this is basically a series all about being delusional and believing in everything. Ghosts, UFOs, conspiracies, the show parodies every genre you can think of, and combined with Studio Shaft's signature style of Baroque compositions and editing, this results in some truly insane images that you will never forget. 
You know how people will sometimes post funny clips from shows out of context? Well, this is a show where seeing the clips in context doesn't make them any less absurd or nonsensical as seeing them without context. Kateni Kaizo is basically what everyone who isn't really familiar with anime imagines anime is. Wacky, Japanese, pervy nonsense, expressed in its most concentrated form. And sometimes that's all you really want. The most anime anime there is. トラウマ高校2年生かつ改造は改造人間であるナゾの怪人に襲われ兵士の重傷を負ったところ天才科学者サイエンスズに改造されリチや戦い続けるのであったと本人は思い込んでいた。